seeds of the imagination of our ancestors. Well, but see, the thing is, yes, I want to say um, specifically to that is that I had to reimagine the whole notion of um, untold RVA this year. You know, I lost my father to COVID last, well, I guess it was, yeah, well, I'm coming up on a year like next week and stuff. And it really caused me to do some inner reflection. And I realized that um, the way that I have been leading people to the burial ground and having them experience the space down there was very much um, something that I've come to realize is called trauma tourism. And um, like, dark tourism and I didn't want to be a part of that and so I really stripped it down to what the essence of it could be my ancestors were spiritualists they were the first to fly the red black and green flag and they believed in the power of the black imagination so everything that I'm rebuilding for 2021 with this new rebrand and relaunch for untold for this uh, summer season is about the power of harnessing the black imagination and I do believe that Richmond is the birthplace of the black imagination we'll talk about that more later I love that smile, Melody. That's Thank awesome. You. Feel encouraged. <laughs> Thank you, Doctor Yitzi. Yes. Well, um, it's it's been a divine journey for me in, in a strange kind of way, and I I think it's appropriate that I ended up in Richmond. I began this journey in New York, um, where I was born and raised, and went to graduate school, and I was in graduate school when the African burial ground in New York was discovered. In fact. I was working on Chambers Street. I could see the excavation site of the New York African Burial Ground from my office window. And, and then I would leave New York and go to uh, teach at Howard University. And, and lo and behold, Michael Blakey would show up at Howard with the remains from the African Burial Ground in New York. And, and long story short, here I am in Richmond. Um, and so I think that for me, trying to uncover or reveal what this journey means and what it has has been part of trying to understand my purpose in Richmond. And I, I think I came here with no intention of staying and I've been here almost 20 years now. Um, and I, I discovered that I'm in the right place, that, that I'm in a special place and that Richmond has found itself at the center of, of these um, revolutions for a very good reason, that, that is historical significance to the black experience and the black narrative in America is central. And I think it's also ironic and interesting and we should examine further why the interest in, in African-American burials, why burial ground, sacred spaces in, in that context have become uh, the, the kind of center of, of um, struggle in Richmond. I find it very interesting, and I, I think there's a very good answer for that. And I think that as the night goes on, we'll probably have a chance to discuss that. But uh, again, Richmond is special historically to the Black narrative. I, I do no notice that the Richmond or the Virginia way of suppressing history has been habitual, that, that even when there are opportunities at my university um, to kind of get out in front of things, to use opportunities not to hide from the past, but to embrace it and to use it as teaching moments, like universities should, they've always failed to do that. And I, I do believe that that's the Virginia way. Um, even when it hurts you uh, not to uh, confront these histories, um, people continue to do it. So I, I wanna hear others talk about that as well. I'm not from Richmond, um, but I've, I've been a guest in your, in your, in your city and, uh, I've been feeling the love and I hope to stay here for at least another 10 years. Yeah, we wanna keep you here, Dr. Yussi. We can't imagine you, you leaving us. Um, your, your feedback is gonna take us into the next question. The conversation about the city's burial, black burial grounds has been front and center as of late. And you discuss the importance of these sacred spaces within the context of both the black Richmond and black American experience. I'll go first on this one, if no one minds. Um, as I was alluding to, I, I think the reason why the, the issue of burial grounds and sacred spaces has risen as a, a rallying cry for the black masses is because it's intricately tied to our humanity. And so although it seems like a struggle to reclaim sacred spaces, to reclaim uh, burial grounds, um, 
the, the struggle we're engaged in is a struggle for reclaiming our humanity. And I think symbolically and certainly historically and culturally, all people ha have acknowledged the importance of uh, burial rituals and rites and, and sacred spaces around burial grounds that are ancient and sacred. And, and so for African people in the Americas and perhaps worldwide, uh, our struggle for our humanity is kind of uh, reflected in the struggle to acknowledge uh, those sacred spaces. I would imagine that, that all cultures hold those spaces sacred, but it's only been Black folks, particularly in Richmond, that have had to really struggle to get others to acknowledge our humanity. And the, the battleground, if you will, has been burial ground. The new battleground, as Anna alluded to, is the African, second African burial ground in Shaco Hill. And its significance is, is, is really, really important. And the way that burial ground came to my attention was that it also was under threat by the high-speed rail. Um, and Sister Laura McQueen, who, who's done spectacular research in that area, uh, has illuminated the importance of that burial ground, that sacred space. More recently, we've seen the um, struggles between uh, the descendant community and the enrichment organization for uh, Greenwood and Oakwood cemeteries um, and trying to uh, figure out the best way to acknowledge that sacred space. So again, the struggles seem to, to center around these places. And I, I, I think we have to understand it for what the struggle really is. Again, as a psychologist, my, my uh, approach to the world sometimes is looking for the unconscious processes, not the, the, the um, manifest content that's in your face, but what's behind uh, what's going on. And I'm thinking on a deeper level, we are, we are coming into our assertion that others must, must recognize and acknowledge and respect our humanity. And we chose uh, burial grounds for that, that struggle to kind of center. Wonderful. Thank you so much, Dr. Yussi. Would anybody else like to chime in? Um, I'll go ahead. It, it, is, it is really interesting the way that um, the burial grounds have become this. It's, it's almost like the quiet thread that's been there all along. And when, you know, the work that I'm trying to do at the American Civil War Museum um, around uh, sort of expanding on Civil War era stories about uh, the Black community of Richmond, um, one aspect of that is the fact that after the, uh, after the war ended, you had free people and free people looking to set up communities. And they were setting up what, what were noted on maps as settlements all around, um, all around Richmond. Uh, some of them become really well-known places like Jackson Ward, um, but there are others. And I apologize for the sound behind me. I, I'm sort of stuck where I am. <laughs> um, but the... Um, uh, places like Zion Town and Burrell Town and uh, uh, Westwood. Westwood still survives. But all of these communities uh, establish the institutions that represent uh, a free people, right? They set up schools, they set up churches, they, uh, and, and with that came the cemeteries. Their houses, the ways that in which they um, banded together in order to create livelihoods uh, to sustain themselves. Um, the relationships that they had to negotiate with the white property owners and with the white establishment that was still hell bent on making sure that, you know, whatever progress they were going to make was going to be contained to some degree. But these burial grounds, in discovering them now, we are discovering these communities again. And we are, by reclaiming them from invisibility and from overgrowth and from control by either complete inability to control them because of a lack of resources or, um, or because they are in the hands of people who don't have their interests at heart, um, by reclaiming those and asserting the right to do that, even though you don't have the deed to the property, um, you know, or some other particular way of, of, of having control that, that the establishment recognizes, people are asserting it anyway. People are saying, these are our people, these were our places, and we have a right to weigh in on what is happening to them and what should happen to them going forward. And it's really remarkable to see that. And as that has happened, they have knit together other narratives around that. You know, one of the most outrageous stories that comes from Richmond is that of uh, grave robbing for medical study purposes 
from burial grounds. And in fact, it turns out to be the burial ground that is on Shaco Hill. That was the one most, uh, most predated, predated, sorry, was uh, the site of the most predation, right? Uh, for that purpose. Um, and so we are not only knitting together the um, physical places, but we are also knitting together the stories that went along with it, things that contribute to cultural practices uh, among Black people, P memory that we don't always know where these things come from. And it turns out that they do come from reality. Um, so it's, it is remarkable. It's, I totally agree. It's a struggle to, to, to claim and assert humanity and interestingly enough, for you know progressive and anti-racist white folks, um, it's it's an that's like low-hanging fruit. They can they just don't have a problem seeing humanity in relation to to cemeteries and, and the way that we treat our treat our dead. Um, so it's it's you know it's definitely there's we don't have the way right. We have not established the one way to do these things. We are in the middle of of sort of figuring this stuff out. Um, but it, it, but I, 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 would, I would concur with, uh, with Sean on that. And you know what, Pri, if you can jump in um, and speak to why the Black Bear Grounds are so sacred, but prior to sharing your thoughts on that, for those that have joined us um, after we started, can you also just give a little bit background on the Black Bear Grounds for those that aren't sure what they are, where they are? Yes, know. yes. So. Um, one of the things that we need to start our conversation with is what Melody said, where is the African burial ground? It's not a mistake that we don't have a readily accessible way to find that out. Many people go past the African ancestral burial ground in Richmond and Shaco, not Shaco Hill, but the specific one that I've been concerned with ever since I met Anna and was asked to come and pour libation for uh, Gabriel's uh, ceremonies in 2007. I remember I was pregnant, Anna, with the baby and she'll turn 13 in like two weeks. So it's been 15 years, you know? Um, so, but that space is on Broad Street and you have to drive over top of literal black bodies every time you go up and down 95. So let's, give everybody like a mental map. Let's just say uh, MCV is on your left and you're going down towards Shaco. You have not hit the McDonald's or the um, Exxon that's on the right or the McDonald's at 17th Street. You're going to wait until you come over the ridge, come down a little hill and there's like an overpass. And as soon as you get down that overpass, you have to whoop, hit that left. If you were to look over the rail, not don't do it if you're driving, that's like, <laughs> But, but if you if you're in a vehicle or a bus or something or SUV, just look over the rail on Broad Street to the left. It would be what would be considered 15th Street. That's the African ancestral burial ground. You can also get to it from, from Main Street Station's backside, and you can go through the tunnel walking, um, and then you'll arrive on this big green space. It looks beautiful. It looks like somebody manicured that grass and got it all together. But I will tell you that a number of our friends, Anna being one of them, um, and folks that were literally willing to put their bodies in harm's way, laid on the ground. Anna, what year was it? Probably about um, 2009 or 10? Nine. You're on mute. There was a VCU die-in, I think, in two thousand nine, and then two thousand nine, um, the die-in. Yeah, yeah, but the 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 um, the civil disobedience that was done was in two thousand and eleven. Yeah, and I do remember when we had that meeting with Saad Alamin, who was one of the very first elders to be able to find a document with this uh, woman, Kay Camborian. And I, these are our elders in this work. Mm -hmm. um, they don't always get their names shouted out, but we would not be here where we are today having this conversation without them. Um, and I always hold space for the notion that we must not only call out our ancestors at every turn, but also like Anjali says, give folks their flowers while they're here, we, we have to do that. So um, they found a map that's um, Kate Camborian. She found a map in her attic. She was a family that had a lot of historical um, relics from the past in their attic. And the map identified that if you laid the map today onto where the map identify, um, it, you will find that the burial ground is located on this space we're talking about at 15th and Broad. So you'll see that it has this big green space 
that was not a green space. It actually was a parking lot. And VCU has um, gone through many, many changes. And the city of Richmond has gone through many, many changing, use, using it for things as disrespectful as a garbage dump on top of people's black bodies that were worked to death to begin with. It was a uh, place where when dogs are, um, or cats and animals, stray animals are euthanized, they would dump their bodies and bury them in shallow graves there. And just all this horrible stuff that you would never think to do to Hollywood Cemetery for that matter. So there was a direct action um, wave and movement that we all contributed to that encouraged the city of Richmond officials to uh, appeal to the good nature of the governor and the uh, mayor and the president of VCU to remove the um, asphalt, which ended up being black contractors that went down there on their own volition and were like, y'all are taking too long, let's just do it. And then now we have this beautiful green expanse. But the reason why we do not have a sign that tells us that this is where you go to salute your ancestors or what have you, is because of that continued racism and toxic inequity within the preservation community to this day that needs to be liberated with self-determined effort and a new generation of concern because there's no reason that there shouldn't be a sign that just says turn left to go honor your ancestors, especially if we're beginning to give the whole notion of the burial ground and what our rooted and rising campaigns are like Black RVA speaks of. There's no reason why people should be coming from states and countries away and don't even know how to find our burial ground. So they did try to bury us, but don't think about it in a past tense. They are trying to bury us, but they didn't know that we were seeds. And they also don't know that we are seeds and seeds multiply like in the wind and we will take over. Um, our legacies will and our destinies will find us and we will, um, we will not, we shall not be moved basically. Those seeds turn to trees. Mm. The forest of family trees. And, and I'll, I'll, just, I'll go ahead and just physically situate the second African burial ground. So it's on the north side of Richmond. And if you were to go, if you start downtown and go to um, 4th Street, 4th uh, Street actually becomes 5th Street at a certain point. Um, and you go north to Hospital Street. And right at that intersection uh, to your left would be the Shaco Hill Cemetery, which was the white cemetery. And then across the street and uh, to your left would be the Hebrew Cemetery. Just beyond that is what was the poor house. And, uh, and then to the right and to the north of that intersection is what looks like an abandoned gas station. And that is the remnants uh, of the original um, African uh, burying ground up there that started off as two acres, grew to 31 acres, and then over the course of the latter 19th and the 20th century got whittled right back down to about 1.2 acres, which the city has recently acquired uh, in order to protect it. Uh, and again, under the auspices of the, um, the work done by Lenore McQueen, who is a descendant of um, at least one, uh, one woman for sure, uh, and possibly others who were buried in that, in that site as well. And the threat to that cemetery uh, is tied to the threats uh, in, uh, still to, this, to the African burial ground down in the bottom, because it's not only high-speed rail, it's also an expansion to the um, Interstate 64, 95, mm -hmm. that passes over the site in that area, as well as work that they want to do to uh, ameliorate some of the traffic problems with the, the fact that there's an intersection where the uh, railroad and street level uh, sort of share common ground. Uh, so they are looking to how to how to fix that. So, uh, and in Chaco Bottom, there's a streets improvement project that is coming through. Uh, there is a repair to the bridge that uh, is Broad Street that creates that tunnel that we walk between the two. That actually has to be repaired. And so that project is coming. So there's a lot that we have to understand about the way, the way a city, you know, looks after its infrastructure, but also how it prioritizes the spaces that it's going to protect in, in the course of that process. And so one of the things that's been, that it has been also good about this struggle is that it's made black spaces um, a priority, at least it's in front of people in a way uh, where they understand they can't simply make the decisions that they used to make, uh, you know, in the fifties when they put interstate 94 through all, you know, through all our, our big neighborhoods here. So um, it, it's, yeah, so there's a lot, there's a, there's a lot for, you know, it's why it takes so many 
uh, of us to to be doing what we're doing uh, because there is that's a lot right. to keep up with. It's true, and I mean, we have really done our due diligence to make sure that we look at each other's work and that we honor the space that each one has been anointed by our own ancestors to work in. And we recognize that we are parts of a whole and that there's a way that these pieces fit together. Like I've always looked at Anna's work and the work of the Sacred Ground Reclamation Project, especially since uh, the connection with the National Historic Trust as something of a replicable model for many, many cities around the world to identify strategies that can be employed to make sure that the community has voice. And when we use the word the community, I wanna put a bookmark there. I don't know if we'll have time to talk about it later, but if you look at some of the reports that have been generated and um, there is a requirement in those, Anna was speaking to it that, you know, um, people's voices be included. They can't just make decisions like in the fifties. But when you use that word and say, well, when they, when I say those who are creating these reports from a municipal or a preservation um, perspective, traditional uh, mainstream preservation perspective, do these reports and they say, oh, we consulted the community. I can't tell you as a person on this panel considered an expert um, the world over in what I know, um, I haven't been consulted or asked my opinion about a lot of things. Um, and it's a way of being able to say the community, well, mm -hmm. I would rather it move to a place where we're asking the community based subject matter experts put that part on it, because if you go in and you just ask Uncle Cletus what he thinks and then you can check the box and say that you asked the community, we all know that you're going to get things that might include the opinions of a five year old and someone who isn't really engaged and embedded within pouring through tomes and tomes of research to know so we have to watch the fact that there is a lot of manipulative, insidious, disrespectful things consistently going on that um, would silence the voice of the, uh, the independent voices of uh, self-determined Black Richmond and all those that support Black freedom here. So I'm not going to give anybody a pass just because we're in this moment of, I don't know if it's post-raciality or post-whatever, but we're in the thick of it even to this moment and we respect one another's work. Like I said, we've had Dr. UT who has been able to create imagery and analysis through um, like um, film. And a lot of people don't need to be put pressure to have to read things in order to know. I truly believe that. And Anna has been um, with her organization holding space to make sure that these areas are protected in the sense of the geography of it um, in those rooms and stuff. And that is a replicable model that Richmond should really be acknowledged for producing that knowledge. Um, and then myself, someone who has always looked at ways to include as many um, community talented creatives in being able to channel the ancestral um, spirituality that emerges from reclaimed sacred spaces, um, especially when you invoke the energy of the red, black, and green in the midst of it. So, um, and now with the new language that I'm using for Untold RVA's projects, um, I'm renaming the space for, as I work in the African Ancestral Burial Ground as, it's called the Imaginarium. And the two elements that are connected, look at Anna smiling, that feels good. Um, the two elements that are connected to the Imaginarium are ancestral wealth and the power of the black imagination. And I'm really hoping that uh, those who are watching this can come to the opening and be able to see how the spirit of our ancestors can inhabit our thoughts to help us to project into the future the things that our children's children's children 100 years into the future will be able to glean as um, their ancestral legacy and their inheritance in the spiritual realm from visiting the burial ground. And we are definitely working to be ready for you all from around the country to come visit. And we'll have a sign up if we have to make a mural ourselves to say turn left. Matter of fact, there is a mural that I'm putting up there that says, uh, consequently, they tried to bury us, but we are seeds. And um, it's just, it goes to show the alignment. Our spirits are all speaking to us from the same place, which is uh, a, self, a place of self-determination and ancestral wealth. They want us to prosper in telling these stories. And we're just not gonna queue it up for somebody to come from far away and be able to monetize what is currently a $7 billion um, industry in Virginia alone for heritage tourism. And there's not a lot of entry points for black people that are from the ascendant community to 
benefit from that and I'll not have it. And I know Anna will not and nor will Sean. And so, yeah. Well, we are definitely grateful for each of you for applying the pressure, <laughs> you know, yeah. because it's very important that that pressure is applied. I'm going to do a slight shift, try to fit in one or two more questions before we head right into Q&A. Um, the work of each of you um, is really rooted in community, um, but you also work within various institutional spaces. Um, Shauna, Anna, you, you both hold positions within an academic and historical institutions, respectively. So given your contribution in both spaces, can you speak to the importance of people from the community advocacy space, specifically uh, the, doing grassroots work, working inside these institutions as we properly contextualize these histories? Um, yeah, so can you speak to that for us? Well, I, I'm glad you asked that question because it's been challenging. And I have to say that Academic institutions, no matter what they say, are not really geared toward community engagement. That's not their thing. Typically, the relationship is one-sided. What I try to do in my role as chair of African American Studies is to live in the tradition of Black Studies departments, whereby we bring the resources to the community. When I was doing that lecture series, um, even my engagement with the, with the film camp that got me involved in filmmaking, was my attempt to be true to the discipline of Black Studies, whereby we deliver our resources, uh, intellectual and otherwise, to the community where it belongs. Um, universities have, have historically exploited the communities around them. Um, but what they don't understand, or they do understand, that, that if, the black, if the Black community in Richmond were to leave and relocate, BCU would collapse. They'd no longer be able to sustain themselves. The research dollars that they get from research and from clinical trials that Black folks participate in would dry up. And so, mm -hmm. what I've been screaming about is this concept of reciprocity. Um, there must be some demand made by the community um, if they're going to continue to participate in clinical trials and other research from VCU or by VCU. There has to be some give back, and the small money they give you for participation is not enough. It's not adequate. Um, I, I've been very vocal uh, while I've been at VCU. Um, I paid the price, but that's the price that, that was worth every ounce of my effort because uh, I'm not at VCU as a professor on my own accord, right? Not because I'm smart or I was, I was shrewd or worked hard, none of that. I'm only there because Black people sacrificed and made it possible for me to be there. So I have a responsibility to do all you said I've done in the, in the, in the introduction and in reading my uh, uh, bio. Uh, that's not I really an accolade. That's really me trying to live up to my responsibility. And, and I, I am uh, responsible to the community or should be held responsible to, by the community to make sure I'm doing that. But again, it's been a struggle at DCU to try and be true to what I want to do because Universities are not set up for community engagement. Um, they do it uh, because it, it's good PR. They do it because there's benefit in terms of research and other kinds of, uh, um, of foundation money. And so it's my responsibility as a black faculty member to make sure they, they stand on their word. And, and so um, that's the, what I've been trying to do. Uh, I know I fall short, but I'll continue to try to do that as long as I'm here. Thank you, Dr. Yussi. We're grateful for you and, you know, your truth and, you, you, you know, doing the work. I love you saying, um, you know, because Black people have laid that foundation for, for you. Um, I just wrote a note to myself, say that. Sometimes I do that. I'm just like talking to myself as you all are hitting some strong points. Um, I do want to open up the floor to our guests, um, those that are joining us this evening, to ask any specific questions they may have about some of the dialogue um, over the past 40 minutes or so. Um, we welcome you to share your questions with us and I'll be sure the panelists are able to answer them. And I, I think- You can actually put it. Oh, I'm sorry. Go ahead. Oh, I'm sorry. Hey, this is Anjali. Uh, I did wanna know with that last question, um, 
thank you so much, Sean, for sharing your perspective through academia uh, and what it looks like uh, for that imbalanced exchange between the academic institution and community. Anna, I don't know if you had any feedback, but I, I know that you're in a historical space and so much of the conversation in Richmond is rooted in history and histories and the expansion of it, especially ones that are rooted in places or times like the Civil War. And so wondering what your experience has been like uh, in your institution. Mm -hmm. Well, you know, it's really interesting. The American Civil War Museum, um, you know, in, in some ways represents uh, an institution that had to really crawl inside its skin and figure out what it actually was, what it had been, and what it was going to be. And so when I joined, uh, or when I went, I started working there um, in part as an intern, but also as part of a fellowship to create an exhibition for the new museum called Southern Ambitions. And Southern Ambitions was to articulate what uh, the Confederacy had had for its ideas for the world if it had won and if it had established an independent nation. And that was in the, the development of that particular exhibit was in the context of the museum having gone through a merger process, a shedding of its old ways and its old narratives with the Museum of the Confederacy and uh, trying to establish itself as a, an actual American Civil War Museum that looked at the events of the Civil War, both leading up to it as well as the legacies of it from a much, much broader perspective. So it was born of a, a, a short-term institution called the American Civil War Center, which focused on three perspectives, and that was uh, Confederate, Union, and Black. And, and so it was the first time that there was an institution here in Richmond that had a permanent exhibit that focused on the United States colored troops upon self-emancipation, um, you know, a better understanding of the whole emancipation proclamation, you know, strategy by the, you know, by Lincoln and the, and the U.S. Army. Um, but what it meant for Black people to take uh, the opportunities that that created and, and self-emancipate on a massive scale and force the Civil War to, to realize what it actually was, which was a war to end slavery. Um, so, you know, as I'm saying that in, in short, manageable sentences, um, a, a museum is a public institution, even if it's privately um, owned, and it has a responsibility to state its mission, to live up to the expectations driven by that mission, um, and then to figure out how to keep in touch with the community that it lives in, in order to deliver um, what, it, what, it, um, what it seeks to do. Um, Christy Coleman was the first Black Executive Director CEO of that organization, and she got there in time to invite Richmond, to help Richmond handle the fact that it was going to actually have a statue of Abraham Lincoln in it, which, you know, for Black people is like, okay, fine, but for <laughs> white Virginians, you know, that was a shock to their nervous systems. And they, they you know, people literally, there were people who literally came out and said, how could you bring him here? He was our enemy. And, you know, so people who are clearly living in a pre-1865 world, but it was a world that was crafted specifically after the Civil War in order to make sure that the South um, could remake itself in an image of itself that had been flipped out, flipped over by the Civil War. Um, but it, but as one person put it to me, you know, the United States may have won the war, but the, but the Confederacy or the South won the narrative, right? And so that narrative, which evolved into the lost cause, um, the lost cause mythology, um, li almost literally and physically, Richmond's institutions were built around that to support that, um, and, and to make sure that those were the permanent pieces of the landscape that would be the reminders for everybody. John Mitchell Jr. wrote about that. They understood it the minute it went when uh, Robert E. Lee's statue went up, they understood that. So again, so rather than continuing to sort of go off on the sort of example tangents um, is understanding that, that, that museums have gone through their own kind of re-examination. And well, I think a, a nice telling uh, slogan that has traveled around the country has been museums are not neutral. And so they are trying to understand how it is that they sit in the community and who they speak to and how they are going to be delivering 
uh, more truthful um, histories and, and maintain uh, the fact that they are still voted apparently in, in big polls, um, the most trusted institutions in the country in terms of truth telling. People go to museums to get the facts. So we hope that they are delivering the facts, right? And that they are framing it in a proper way. So it's, a, it's an institution I think that has done um, a, a, a good job to the extent that it has, as far as it has gone, but it's got a long way to go, and, you know, and there's a lot yeah. to do. And, and critical to doing that is going to be um, diversifying the staff. And that's, that's just the way it is. And that, that's the case in historic preservation. Um, we need more black and brown people in these institutions and in these places to reimagine them, right? I mean, I think that's such a good word uh, Free is using uh, for her for her work going forward. That reimagining is is right. It has, it has to be. It honest. is. It's critical to think of it as that. And really, what is the most like rich commodity that we have had other than? deep black imagination, it's free. Mm -hmm. And you can push your consciousness out to imagine anything that you want to only imagine what brother General Gabriel and his comrades on the gallows who were hung right there overlooking five feet away from what is now the African ancestral burial ground. When they were on that gallows, it just occurred to me that I was like, these people must have been, they, first of all, let's just call it what it is they were willing to die for whatever they were imagining. So much so that the moment that the noose tightened and the floor dropped out and they hung um, by their necks, the imagine harnessing whatever future projection that they had in their mind. Mm -hmm. And so in that moment, that's why Richmond is so ripe for bringing people here to tap into that beautiful green space as an imaginarium. But I just do want to say, Anna, though, to the point of the museums and looking to grapple with their uh, difficult and um, challenging relationships with being the narrative keepers and purveyors of uh, Richmond's culture. The thing about it is, I don't feel that anyone would agree that those who offended should decide what their <laughs> what their give back to the offended should be. And I don't mm -hmm. see enough opportunities for us to weigh in and say, all right, so you've been having these like effed up like exhibits all this time for the longest. And now we're just gonna let you decide how you're gonna tell the narrative. It's got to be some um, conversation coming from folks. And another thing I wanna say, if we already know that incarceration and lack of um, education and access and internet, the, the digital divide and all of this stuff, if we already know that this has plagued our generations and our culture, then chances are most of the most brilliant people would be self-taught and wouldn't have had access to a PhD education. So for the institutions to require people to have masters and PhDs in order to contribute, to determining their subject matter expertise that they may have arrived at independently like I did. So I'm not college educated for what I know. I just picked, I mean, shoot, we live in the internet age. We can read anything we want, right? And if it's ancestrally guided, I can know the same thing that Dr. Yutsi knows simply because of my passion and self-determination. It's actually kind of even more valuable because now we can show everyday people that they can't, they won't be left out of the narrative, right? Mm -hmm. um, so I just wanna say that it's very important that we call these, these preservation institutions, these mainstream ones, to um, the task of allowing the decision of what they um, exhibit in their galleries um, to give an opportunity to our community subject matter experts that may not have um, the money or the time or the resources to go through PhD level uh, education. And just like when Anna said that, that um, that exhibit that was going on to reimagine the um, Confederacy, I my stomach flipped over. I literally had to get water to wash down what would have been throw up if I'd let it come up because why should we be spending millions and exhibits cost millions of dollars. Why should we be spending millions of dollars to allow the imagination of that fuckery to come into the world when if anything, we should be imagining the world that people were willing to die for in the black freedom narratives that have been deliberately submerged by these very institutions. So that is one example of how left to their own devices, they're gonna choose wrong every time. So this is why our advocacy is so important. 
now and forever. So I'll, I'll just, I'll demure just a little bit, um, just because that particular exhibit, um, that was the, that's, that was the premise, but the premise was to show uh, what their ambitions were and how those ambitions were thwarted and the people and the events and the things that, that made it impossible for that, that to come to, that to come to reality. So it's, 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 it it's complicated, but I can think of a lot of other ways to do that than let's see what the confederate imagination can drum up for the afternoon well, no, but yeah but we can come and see it because what it did was it provided um it was a way it was another way to give contact to the way in which that was combated um and the different peoples and it and it, it also gives a portal to understanding that the civil war was not just a u.s based event it was an event that affected uh the world and so um so it gets to touch on it. it's a small exhibit and it gets to touch on those things um, and I think that's, imp that's important as well. That's fair, that's fair. But perspective is everything. And I think that they've had enough time to be able to glorify the um, toxic imagination coming from that perspective. I would like to be a lot more dead center on what were you trying to stop us from doing? Case in point, Brother General Gabriel, when they were looking to take the governor hostage in 1800, they wanted to build an intentional community, right? I've never seen anything that's been able to expose what their world that they wish to see, that they were willing to die for. Um, and yeah. so this is why I say there's a whole lot of things you can do and left to their own devices. If we don't consistently apply that pressure, as Melody um, stated, you never know. Um, it can always be that much better. Mm -hmm. Sprinkle a little melanin on it. It'll be always better. Always better. Um, <laughs> we have a question from Holly Freeman this evening. Okay. All right. Thank you all for um, the, the valuable information. Um, this is really timely and apropos. I'm on the um, RPL Foundation Board, and we are coming up on our centennial and thinking of, of thinking about the, um, the, the ways in which education has impacted communities of color, black communities. Um, I also went to high school in, at Open High School in the Rosa Bowser building on 00 Clay Street in the heart of Jackson Ward. And so, um, so this is kind of coming full circle. And I wanna, um, so I think there's a lot of opportunity to, opportunity to talk about um, centering the role of education, how we self-educated as free as you were talking about, like how we self-educate and how we can continue to self-educate. And the role that institutions play or don't play in that. So I would be, and I think that Cisha, this is right, right up your alley. So I would love to just hear more about that. And um, so that's really, so it's not really a question, but I just want to like hear more about how you all are thinking about or what are some possibilities or what are some conversations we can have about centering um, self-efficacy around education and those institutions that were designed to educate or to stop us from being educated as it relates to the Jackson Ward neighborhood, since we're sitting right, since the library is hosting this and we're right in the heart of Jackson Ward where the Rosa Bowser building is and some other um, monuments, some other um, buildings. Well, I'll chime in on behalf of Jackson really quickly. You know, I still geek out at the fact that we're even doing a lecture series with Library of Virginia Rich Public Library. I mean, and it's based on me and Anjali doing work ourselves. I mean, really getting in, into these spaces and trying to figure out our truths for ourselves and not because someone said this was the truth, but really trying to explore for primary artifacts to find the truth. And inherent as our in our work is to try to create spaces where Black Richmonders have access to learn the truths for themselves too. And so, you know, one of the uh, lectures later on in the series will be one called The Virginia Way. And it will consist of the local institutions, uh, you know, representatives from across the city in historically oppressive spaces and what they are doing to create diverse, equitable and inclusive and welcoming spaces where black people can belong to, to, to find their own education. And so I think it's a very fair question um, because, you know, I know that Free's talking about like the self-efficacy piece. But what we've really learned through Jackson is that some of our truths are behind gates. That's right. And so what is the role and the commitment of these institutions to give access so that you can truly see the full, complete, and honest picture? And so I think that's a, a very fair um, comment, Holly.
I know well, I'm, um, oh, I was just going to say real quick that I struggle oftentimes because I can't seem to get the files that I want out of ResearchGate. And when I tried to apply for an application there, they said that we can't prove your credential as a actual researcher. Therefore, we are denying you access. And um, it's just unconscionable that people would be turned away when they really want to utilize the resources there because they don't have really at the time, um, it was because you have to have like um, a university or institution based email. And so I think one of the things just to give you, Holly, something that institutions can do is, you know, make. Uh, institutional emails available to folks that come to you and let it be known. And not only that, just seek out researchers. I know I have notebooks full of things that I've written down in books over the years, but I'm just not a skilled researcher from, you know, I didn't go to an institution that taught me how to write down the footnotes and everything. So, oh my God, when I get ready to write a book, I'm going to need a whole team, you know, and that's actually, I had interns from University of Richmond that uh, we're from the Race and Racism at UR project. Shout out to y'all. Peace to love y'all. And they assigned five students to do all of my backstory research um, because of a, um, a decolonizing uh, strategy that I developed where um, people that are independent subject matter experts and self-educated can have the support of institutional um, students, you know, that know how to do this research. So pairing people together um, in that way can be a very, very strong um, strategy for being able to decolonize knowledge bases in the service of the community and the black community. Thank you. Um, we have um, received word that tonight's session is being extended by 15 minutes. So we do welcome another question or two if anyone is interested in asking another question. You can either uh, take yourself off mute to ask a question or you can drop it in the chat. Um, can I actually chime in? Because I have a question. So at mm -hmm. the root of Jackson is this gentleman named Abraham Skipwith. And Abraham Skipwith had a granddaughter who married a gentleman named Peter Roper. And Peter Roper in 1848 purchased land on behalf of the Union Burial Ground Society for a um, burial ground for free Black Richmonders. Do we know where that particular space is located? within the city? You know, that's a good question because uh, it remind. I think if I'm not mistaken, uh, that there was a, a burying ground called Union that became part of the collection of adjacent cemeteries on the north side that we now know as the Barton Heights cemeteries. Um, a lot of people don't realize that it's a plural. <laughs> it's a collection of cemeteries. And so when the second African burial ground was being established in 1816 for the city, meaning a municipal site for people who didn't have any money, that was where they would be buried. Um, the Free Burying Society of, of, of the Free Black Burying Society of Richmond um, had established itself and had petitioned for that to be created, but had also um, purchased land and established, I think, the first uh, free Black cemetery uh, in the city of Richmond. And that would have been the first of the ones that became part of Barton Heights, so over near um, first, uh, first Street on North Side, I think. Um, but yeah, if you look that up, um, you should see that they will give you a list of all the cemeteries that were um, that were consolidated into that. And that consolidation only happened, um, I think, in the 1990s, maybe. Thank you. Yeah. Dr. Moon, I wonder if you would outline for us um, how you intend to use the rest of your series. I heard, I heard your first talk and as I told you, I was totally blown away, but it was not recorded. And I wondered if there was any uh, plan to repeat that evening with you and your sister to talk about just the basic history of the ward, you know, all of the um, never published research you all, you all discovered who it was named for, all that stuff. I just wondered if you would um, kind of lay out the rest of the series and, and such. Thank you. Anjali, you want to chime in? Well, hello. And, you know, thank you, you know, for your continued interest in this. 
uh, project, we will be creating more spaces to tell these histories uh, while the next few series are kind of already earmarked in terms of conversations that we're hoping to have. Uh, as we get closer to October, uh, which is actually when our culminating event will happen, uh, we will likely be hosting some spaces where we will revisit some of this. Uh, also in September, we're looking to do a Jackson Project uh, program as a part of uh, Africana Film Festival. We'll also talk about it there. So we just invite you to follow Jackson Project if you're not already um, on Instagram at BJXN Project as well as Facebook. Um, and we'll make sure to kind of keep churning the information out because uh, we understand that creating these pockets uh, while necessary, they are just that, they're pockets. And so we have to figure out ways to open it up so that more people, maybe people who aren't following Richmond Public Library or the Library of Virginia also have an opportunity to gain access. Uh, so, you know, we want to make sure we are dismantling barriers as well. So uh, we are coming. Thank you very much for the inquiry. And it's good to know that people are interested in hearing it again. <laughs> And, and one quick thing, the next series, June 23rd, I guess it's a plug, uh, will be one called Walk the Ward. It's going to be moderated by Gary Flowers, and we're actually going to have a panel that's going to consist of multi-generational panelists. And so we're going to have people from fifth generation Jackson Wardians all the way down to the great, great granddaughter Maggie L. Walker and Moselles and folks like that. And so, you know, I know that a lot of our work might be inherently anchored in uh, artifacts, but this particular talk is going to be a great um, juxtaposition of artifacts and anecdotes. And so please join us on June 23rd because Free made a great point. You know, other people have been holding space for Jackson Ward well before the Jackson Project. And so using this um, lecture series to try to elevate other people's voices um, is going to be very important as well. So I am going to, I know we have until 8.15. I always think it's really nice to be able to um, leave our guests with a charge of sorts. And so I have one question, one final question for our panelists. Um, as organizations like the Jackson Project work to elevate the untold stories of Black Richmond um, and amplify our legacy, which we all know is rooted in ambition and creativity and resilience, and just the sheer uh, will to create a better life for ourselves, hence the establishment of our Black Wall Street community, Jackson Ward here in Richmond. What would you say to our guests joining us that may be in search of a way to help with these efforts? Um, where, where should they start? Well, attending these events is a good start. <laughs> That's right. <laughs> That's exactly it. Just continue yeah. to, you know, support mm -hmm. all things that, you know, are uh, led by independent voices that are speaking truth to power as much as they um, can. Um, let me retract that. Not speaking truth to power, but speaking true to those who wish to um, usurp power from the natural born um, legacy holders of our power, which is uh, brown folks. Um, also, you saw it first, this is a bag of newly minted cowrie shells that are part of the ancestral wealth element of the Imaginarium. Um, I'm going to be doing a pop-up at Six Points Innovation Center every month. It's called Ancestral Wealth. It, the people that are selling there don't have to pay a dime to be there. This is um, to be able to support those who dream of being able to come to Melody and say, I want to sell at the night market, but they're not quite ready. And so Six Points Innovation Center is located in um, in Highland Park, uh, the last ungentrified Black neighborhood in the city of Richmond, along um, Meadowbridge Road. And that expanse of that street, uh, the mayor gave a proclamation to Untold RVA to designate that space as the uh, Black Monument Avenue. And so you can come there once a month and you cannot use dollars. You have to use one of these. They can't be uh, replicated because these were designed by Marche Weishat. Um, at Rumors Boutique, who I look at as being a very, very strong and innovative uh, Black uh, woman entrepreneur. And so when you come into the pop-up shop, you trade $5 and you get one of these and everything you purchase, you use uh, because I'm holding space for liberation and self-determination. And so that we don't have to continue to trade uh, dollars, we can use our own symbol of uh, ancestral wealth, which is known as the cowrie. But um, by all means, please, the one thing I'll ask you to do is stop thinking about our ancestors in the, the thought process of lack 
and desperation and despair and um, we are their legacy. And so I, I try not to look like I'm struggling. Um, and you should also um, recognize that these spaces, although they're very contentious and very sad, there were some amazing dreams coming out of them. So hold space for the power of the Black imagination as much as possible. It's what I ask. And I'll just, <clears throat> I'll, I'm going to go sort of back technical and, and, uh, and towards the campaign, which is We've got a Shackle Bottom Memorial Park, which is now being called part of a heritage campus. But what's important about the whole effort to get this, this black space to have priority in the, in the imaginations of city planners and in what we hope this city is going to look like in the 20, 30 years coming up um, is, is to actually be involved in some, of, in some of the stuff that is not sexy and is not exciting on the one hand, but leads to incredibly um, either empowering or, um, uh, or gut-wrenching uh, consequences later on. And that is something as simple as the word zoning. So how the zoning gets changed uh, in the city of Richmond, what is allowed to be built and what is not allowed to be built in different places and how the city uh, and its partners sort of are involved in that and how they do that and why they put things forward you know, sometimes it's tied to the political process, sometimes it's tied to the, to the profit process, um, but our voices matter more than ever and they, and they, need, to be, um, they need to be engaged at these kinds of levels as well. And so I really encourage people um, to, to go into these fields and to pay attention to what's going on because that's the other thing is you can learn what's going on and how to support it or interfere with it, how to make it represent what you actually want. You do not have to go to school to do that. Um, and you can attend a few city council meetings and get a very clear idea how some of that happens. Um, we, we, can, we can do what we need to do with this city. Um, it's, it's right there for us. Thank you so much. Yeah. Okay, yeah. back to you, see? <laughs> I, I, would, I would agree with what Anna said, and I, I think my own suggestion is, is to go out there and visit these sites um, and develop a personal relationship with the space. Uh, I invite you to go check out Sister Lucy Taylor behind me at Chocolate Hill uh, Burying Ground. Um, and there are lots of stories. And, and somehow when I discovered Sister Lucy Taylor, I became attached to her story. Uh, and, and it kind of connects you to these spaces. And, and I think that that's going to be crucial. You have to feel ownership, connection. Um, I don't care where you're from. Uh, these are our stories. Uh, as Anna will point out, that most Black folk in the United States probably have some ancestry coming through Richmond at, at some point in the history of this country. Um, so let's, let's go to discover it and take ownership of it. Uh, the, the work that's being done now um, with the, uh, the um, Well Project, uh, keep abreast of that work um, with regard to the remains that were found in the well um, and what's happening, developments about uh, memorialization, Reinterment research that's coming down the pike. Um, not only get involved, but take ownership of that because it's going to be uh, yours, all of ours. And I know we're getting ready to go. I just want to piggyback off of what uh, Dr. Ut and, and Anna and Freya said. But I think what you said, um, Dr. Ut, is so important is that we understand that whatever it is the Jackson Project is talking about, what all of these prolific uh, scholars are talking about on this, on this panel, they are not something happening outside of us. They are an extension of us. And we are here in this moment because we're called to do our bit of work with it, whatever that work might look like. And I think what Anna is saying is really important and it connects to something important Free was saying about, you know, not having, you know, letters behind your name uh, in order to gain access. We're hoping to dismantle some of that. And part of that dismantling is helping people to understand that as community members, you can have a say in the way things get zoned. One of the pieces of work that we're doing through the Jackson Project is helping people to understand these commissions and these boards that happen through the city where people from Richmond City can just simply be tapped. All you have to do is put in your application, but a lot of times it is not actually promoted to the full community. And so we are hoping to help rectify some of that so that as we look 
150 years in the future, what Jackson Ward and other neighborhoods would look like, it can be something that reflects the heart and the spirit and the, the knowledge that we have amassed over the last 150. So I just wanted to like jump in and, and, and say that okay. and say thank you all. Thank you. So glad to be a part of this. Power to the people, y'all. Mm -hmm. Maybe so. Well, I think this concludes the panel portion of tonight's um, presentation. I'm going to turn it back over to Dr. Cisha Moon and Anjali Moon. This conversation was fantastic, and I am personally looking forward to um, joining the conversation as an attendee next month. Thank you, Thank guys. You, I know Alex, Alex is going to close us out, but, you know, just housekeeping, you know, don't forget June 23rd, Walk the Ward, 7 p.m., um, hopefully you'll join us where we talk about a multi-generational experience in Jackson Ward. And um, just thank you guys. I mean, tonight is what black brilliance looks like. And so thank you for your time. And we hope to see you on June the 10th as well. For those who were able to get tickets or have joined the wait list uh, at Maymont, we will be uh, presenting the premiere of How the Monuments Came Down, a documentary where you will see some of the faces who are actually uh, on this panel uh, represented uh, in an excellent documentary by Field Studios. Uh, so for those who got tickets, we found we sold out today, but we're trying to figure out a way to uh, create more space for more seating. Um, so please join the waitlist is what we ask. You can go to the Jackson Project, uh, jxnproject.com, sign up. Great. Um, thank you, Anjali. And thank you, Cisha, very much. Um, and thank you as well to all of our panelists tonight for this great conversation um, that we look forward to continuing next month on June 23rd. And um, where will recordings be? We are recording this feed. Um, we will put it up on Richmond Public Library's YouTube channel. And there is a link to that now in the chat. Um, so it, it might take a few days, but keep your eyes peeled. Awesome. And I think that's it. Thank Thanks very much, everyone. Have a good night. Thank, Thank you. Thank you. Thank you.